Filmmaking can be a true art. It combines drama, motion, sound, and photography. In cinema, you can create worlds of your own, or you can show this world in nearly all of its facets. I took up filmmaking in high school in the year 1969. My parents had given me a home movie camera for Christmas, and Super 8 filmmaking would become a passion for the next four years. Now, there was no home video at that time, and so most amateur filmmakers like myself produced their film works on Super 8 movie film. Super 8 was actually a serious artistic medium for many people, as you can see by the sophistication of this camera here. Now, Super 8 film came in cartridges like this. Each cartridge was four and a half minutes long. After you shot the cartridge, then you would go ahead and send it to a photo lab where it would be developed like any ordinary film. Once the film came back from the lab, it would be on reels like this. Then the reels would be edited like any regular Hollywood movie in that you would go ahead and just cut the film at the shots where you wanted them and then splice them together with either a special cement or a special glue. The challenge for us was to create movies that told the story through silent acting, through photography, and through motion. And once we did that, then we would create a soundtrack on a separate reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder where we would put narration, we would put music, we would put sound. To show the film, you would go ahead then and project your movie on a movie projector and then play the tape recorder at the same time. So you'd actually have a movie with stereophonic sound. The late 60s and early 70s were an interesting time to be making films. The Vietnam War was still raging, and so America was still undergoing the transformation that began in the 60s. This was a time of very deep questioning at a fundamental level, and of trying to find alternative ways of looking at things. Student films often reflected this, and so there are many are worth keeping as a product of the times. What you'll see now is a collection of Super 8 movies that my friends and I made between 1969 and 1973. And I'll show them in chronological order so that you'll be able to see the development of our style and of our technique over time, and you'll be able to see how it improved. But these are not slick Hollywood productions. These were student films that were made for about $75 each, with the most expensive being just right under about $300. Sadly, our film suffered the universal fate of most Super 8 movies. They've become embedded with dirt and with scratches. And also, a Super 8 film is inherently grainy. But I hope that you'll look past those drawbacks and enjoy our youthful and very enthusiastic efforts at creating cinematic art. The first movie is called The Bad Day. It was made for our annual high school variety show, and it was a big hit there. The Bad Day is about what you would expect for a first-time amateur high school movie and it barely portends the much more serious efforts to follow.
Our sincerest thanks to the DePaul Vending Company, Mr. Richard Moyer, Chris Price, and Mr. Gerald Zappelli, whose cooperation made this film possible. Music by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, drum sequences by John Buchanan. By this time, I was a high school senior. My mind was filled full of the images from the movies of Bergman, Hitchcock, Fellini, Kubrick. The next movie you're about to see was my first serious movie. It's called Broken Child. We called my serious movies Doll and Heavies because of their very ponderous, serious themes. Broken Child was inspired by a high school health class. I enjoyed a good home life, and so I was appalled to read about children who were sometimes horribly abused in their homes by their mothers, sometimes even with the father looking on. Well, I knew this had all the makings of a great psychological impressionist horror movie. Broken Child went on to win some critical success. It shared first place in a statewide competition, the California High School Film Festival. It also received a second place award at an international film festival in Africa. And it received a special mention at the renowned International Film Festival at Cannes in their amateur division. Well, despite the somber tone of the movie, my friends and I uh, had a lot of fun making it. Our movie making took us to many locations, including Onion Nuevo Beach, where we got to see the sea elephants coming ashore. And we also never missed an opportunity to go out for pizza and for hamburgers after a long day of filming. Uh, we like to goof around in front of the camera quite a bit, and so you'll see outtakes that uh, we made from all that uh, goofing around after Broken Child.
I was completely hooked on surrealism. I was also reading about human psychology and the idea that some people sometimes play social and emotional games with one another instead of just experiencing natural human attachment and friendship. There was something lurking in the mind, some beast that caused people to do this. That beast was the pain from the past. Now some people try to run away from facing that beast and rely on emotional crutches instead, which we symbolize in the next movie as a table and chair. Such people don't realize that in a sense they are running away from themselves. With two good friends, Bob and Glenn, who shared my mania for ponderous cinematic excesses, we set off to make the beast under our proud motto, anything for the sake of art. We made three versions. The first version was completed hastily to qualify for the high school variety show, but as the old saying goes, haste makes waste and the movie flopped. So Bob, Glenn and I decided to do a remake. Now sadly version number two also flopped. It was very nicely photographed and the acting was excellent, but the film moved too slowly, the symbolism was obscure, and the story was utterly incomprehensible. Undaunted, we made version number three, which you're about to see. And in version number three, we try to show symbolically how it's better to face the beast rather than to be buried by an emotional crutch. Before the movie starts, you'll hear the sound synchronization instructions that I recorded for the movie when I was 19 years old. After the movie, you'll see our final outtake film, which we call The Human Pendulum, and it contains shots from all three versions of the beast. Tape speed seven and a half inches per second, recording level two and a half. Adjust volume and stereophonic setting to the following piece of music. Upon hearing the music, begin projection. We met in darkness, and in darkness I saw him die. My friend was killed because he tried to run away from feeling pain. And I tried to run too, but well, that is what our story is all about. This fantasy begins with my friend, the timid fellow. Within him dwells a beast called emotional pain. Much to my friend's distress and chagrin, this beast wants release, won't remain ignored. Frightened of seeing his own pain, he tries to run away from it. He seeks escape by hiding beneath the table, which will then carry him into an unusual darkness. Now I too have a beast of which I am frightened. When it rises to tell me I'm hurt, I flee to the chair and find refuge in darkness. You see, in darkness glows the promise of escape. And now our story.
I take you now to another town where I will be given the choice to face or flee the beast.
The light slowly disappeared with the coming of dawn. Still searching, we found ourselves in the midst of a strange new world. 